My name is Dr. Jessica Bresnik, and I'm speaking on behalf of the COVID and long-term care study group about our recent publication titled Early Omicron Infection is Associated with Increased Reinfection Risk in Older Adults in Long-Term Care and Retirement Facilities. This publication was possible due to funding by the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force of the Public Health Agency of Canada. The COVID and long-term care study is a Canadian observational cohort of around 1,300 residents, on average 85 years of age, within long-term care and retirement homes primarily located in the greater Hamilton and Toronto regions of Southern Ontario. These homes provide a variety of individualized health care and other support services to their residents. The study examines SARS-CoV-2 vaccination and infection through collection of information on facility-associated metrics, individual medical histories, and biological samples to assess antibody and immune cell responses. Throughout the pandemic and to date, we've been able to provide real-time data to public health agencies to support evidence-based decisions about vaccination in older adults. When the SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines were first introduced in 2021, we and others found that they generated antibody and cellular immune responses that protected against infection in older adults, and thus they significantly reduced the numbers of COVID-19 cases, their severity, and deaths. We also learned that this protective immunity decreases over time, so additional vaccinations are essential to prolong that protection. With the emergence of the Omicron variants in 2022, the situation changed significantly, as illustrated by this graph showing the weekly number of long-term care and retirement homes in Ontario with COVID-19 outbreaks. For much of last year, we went through these three-month cycles of increasing and decreasing numbers of homes in outbreak. These data tell us that with the emergence of the Omicron variants and their continued evolution, that despite high vaccination rates and much lower mortality than in the pre-vaccine era, many older adults in long-term care and retirement homes were still being infected with Omicron variants of SARS-CoV-2. With the emergence of the Omicron variants, what we also noticed last year is that a number of participants in our cohorts started to have multiple Omicron infections, especially with the emergence of the BA5 variant. Collectively, these observations were the basis for our new publication, as they prompted us to ask what factors increased risk of Omicron BA5 infection in older adults. To answer this question, we examined incidents of SARS-CoV-2 infection in 750 participants in our study cohort with the initial wave of Omicron BA5 outbreaks between July 1st and September 13th, prior to the rollout of bivalent vaccines. All individuals included in the analysis had four monovalent mRNA vaccines as of the start of the observation period. Within the observation period, around 18% of our cohort had a PCR-confirmed infection. Now, you may predict that there is a higher risk of any infection with factors such as increasing age, if an individual is frail or has other medical conditions, if they have increased risk of exposure to the virus in their place of residence, and if they have less protective immunity, perhaps due to increased time since their last vaccination. Using a Cox regression model, we assessed risk of Omicron BA5 infection by these and other factors, considering demographics, infection history, vaccine combination, facility-associated factors, frailty, and time since fourth vaccination. On this graph, higher risk is indicated by a greater distance to the right from the y-axis. We found that risk of Omicron BA5 infection was not associated with age or sex. There was a slight decreased associated risk of infection in individuals of any four mixed mRNA vaccines compared to four Pfizer mRNA vaccines. Place of residence, the number of facility COVID-19 outbreaks, individual frailty, and time since vaccination were not significantly associated with infection risk. But what was most striking was that when we considered infection history, we found that risk of Omicron BA5 infection was significantly associated with having had one prior Omicron BA1 or BA2 infection compared to having had no prior infections. Therefore, recent Omicron infection is associated with increased risk of subsequent Omicron BA5 infection. These findings made us reevaluate what we know about protective immunity after vaccination and infection in older adults. As mentioned, it is well established that vaccination provides protective immunity against SARS-CoV-2 infection. Following from this, it is generally thought if a vaccinated individual has a subsequent infection, then that provides a post-infection hybrid immune response, 
that's characterized by having enhanced antibody and cell-mediated protection against future infection. The regression analysis therefore compared infection risk of individuals with prior infection and hybrid immunity to individuals with no prior infection and vaccination-associated immunity. So our findings were rather unexpected, as the analysis showed that a prior Omicron BA1 or BA2 infection, and thus presumptive enhanced protective hybrid immunity, was associated with higher risk of subsequent Omicron BA5 infection. These results suggested that there could be issues with the generation of robust hybrid immunity. So we considered if hybrid immunity after an Omicron BA1 or BA2 infection actually increased protective immunity against subsequent Omicron BA5 infection within our cohort of older adults. To examine hybrid immunity, we assessed antibody and cellular immune parameters in individuals who had blood collected in the three months before the start of the observation period. By examining immune responses directly preceding the observation period, we were able to assess potential protective immunity against subsequent SARS-CoV-2 infection. We stratified these pre-observation period immune data according to whether individuals had an Omicron BA1 or BA2 infection prior to their blood collection, and then according to whether they had a Omicron BA5 infection during the observation period. The SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines are designed to train the immune system to recognize and target the spike surface protein of the virus. We initially examined serum IgG and IgA antibodies that could bind to the spike protein and its receptor binding domain, or RBD region. We found that individuals with hybrid immunity from an Omicron BA1 or BA2 infection prior to the blood collection and start to the observation window, shown here in blue, had increased serum antibody levels compared to individuals with no prior infection. These data indicated that while there is significant heterogeneity or range in responses, hybrid immunity generally increased serum antibody levels in older adults. When we stratified these data from individuals after their initial Omicron BA1, BA2 infection in context of where they had a subsequent Omicron BA5 infection in the observation period, we found that individuals with reinfections had significantly lower anti-RBD IgG serum antibodies before their reinfection. Therefore, while hybrid immunity overall increased serum antibody levels, many individuals with Omicron reinfections had lower antibody levels after their initial Omicron infection. We next considered levels of serum neutralizing antibodies, which are antibodies that not only bind to the virus, but also prevent it from infecting cells. We found that while there was again significant heterogeneity in these data, Individuals with an Omicron infection and blood collection prior to the start of the observation window, shown in blue, had higher neutralizing antibody capacity compared to individuals with no prior infection. This was true for neutralization of both the ancestral virus, as shown on the left, which the monovalent mRNA vaccines are designed to target, and the Omicron BA1 variant, as shown on the right. In addition, Antibodies of reduced ability to neutralize the Omicron BA1 variant in particular were observed prior to the observation period in individuals who were reinfected. So while hybrid immunity overall increased viral neutralization, many individuals with Omicron reinfections in the observation period had lower neutralizing antibodies after their initial Omicron infection. We also considered T cells, which have a number of roles in the antiviral response including activation of antibody-producing B cells, cytokine production to instruct other immune cells, and direct killing of virus-infected cells. We measured CD4-positive and CD8-positive memory T-cell responses by an activation-induced marker assay. T-cell responses against the Omicron BA1 spike protein were similar in individuals with no prior infection and after an Omicron BA1, BA2 infection, and were also similar in individuals with and without Omicron reinfection during the observation period. Therefore, memory T cell responses to the viral spike protein were similar irrespective of infection history. We further considered that our observations of decreased tumoral hybrid immune responses in some individuals after an Omicron BA1 or BA2 infection could be the result of underlying immune defects or immunosuppression, possibly due to age-associated changes to the immune system, often referred to as immunosenescence. These factors would also be expected to decrease antibody-mediated protective immunity after vaccination. So we examined pre-infection vaccine responses in our cohort 
to determine if individuals with Omicron reinfections had normal SARS-CoV-2 specific immune responses after vaccination and prior to their Omicron infections. We found that virus neutralization by serum antibodies was similar after second mRNA vaccinations as shown on the left and after third mRNA vaccinations as shown on the right, irrespective of future Omicron infection outcomes. These data indicate that in individuals with Omicron reinfections, that there were no apparent underlying immune defects or immunosuppression impeding the generation of humoral protective immunity. In addition, samples collected after Omicron reinfections showed antibody responses that were similar to those of individuals after a single Omicron infection, whether BA1, 2, or 5. Collectively, they said it implied that unique differences in biological responses to the initial Omicron BA1 or BA2 infection contributed to increased risk of Omicron BA5 infection. In summary, we found that Cox regression analysis in our vaccinated residents of long-term care and retirement homes that age, sex, and frailty, as well as time since last vaccination and the number of facility outbreaks were not significantly associated with Omicron BA5 infection risk. Individuals with no prior infections without hybrid immunity were also not at increased risk. Rather, counterintuitively, our data show that early Omicron BA1 or BA2 infection increased risk of subsequent Omicron BA5 infection. Furthermore, despite significant heterogeneity in immune responses and a similar ability to generate protective immunity after vaccination, suggesting a lack of underlying immune defects or immunosuppression, Less robust hybrid antibody responses after Omicron BA1, BA2 infection were observed in some individuals, particularly those with subsequent Omicron BA5 infection. The current guidelines of public health agencies in Canada and many other countries are that SARS-CoV-2 infection enhances protective immunity. Yet, our data show it should not be assumed that any SARS-CoV-2 infection will provide enhanced hybrid immune protection against future infection in older adults in long-term care and retirement homes. Older adults have significant heterogeneity and protective immunity after vaccination, as well as after infection. Our findings therefore support continuation of vaccination programs irrespective of infection history to maintain protective immunity in this vulnerable population. It is important to acknowledge the limitations of this study, which include the following. It is unclear how generalizable the data will be to healthier community-dwelling older adults. As infections were identified by a positive PCR test, asymptomatic infections may not have been identified. Infection symptoms, severity, and outcomes were also unknown. As well, we considered facility-based exposure by outbreak history and healthcare-based exposure by frailty, neither of which were associated with infection risk, but we could not fully control for differences in individual exposure to SARS-CoV-2. In addition, we were unable to definitively determine the SARS-CoV-2 variants of infection from genomic sequencing, so specific Omicron variants of infection were assumed based on infection date and public health genomic surveillance data. We also cannot predict whether our observations of infection risk and immunity are applicable to infections with other Omicron variants. For more information, I encourage you to read our publication, now available from eClinical Medicine. You can also visit our study website and various social media platforms and contact our lead investigators, Dr. Don Badish and Dr. Andy Costa, if you have any questions.